Okay, good morning uh, to all our colleagues here in the United States and uh, good evening to our friends and colleagues in India and uh, good afternoon to Dr. Bruno all the way in uh, Italy. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today for our 11th uh, seminar and the joint webinar series between Binghamton University and uh, VIT. Uh, as a reminder, this is a co-organized uh, session between the VIT and Binghamton University. Dean Vasudevan, Dr. Rajesh Nair and myself are delighted to welcome all of you to join us as part of this webinar uh, series. And today we are uh, honored to have Dr. Jung Yan Cho, who will be giving a seminar on his research. Uh, Dr. Cho is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and of the Material Science and Engineering program at Binghamton University. Currently, Dr. Cho also serves as the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies in the Thomas J. Watson College of Engineering and Applied Science. He joined the university after finishing a postdoctoral research appointment at the University of California, Santa Barbara from 1999 to 2001. Dr. Cho received his PhD in material science and engineering from Lehigh University in 1998, a master's degree in material science and engineering from Northwestern University in 1993, and a bachelor's degree in metallurgical engineering from Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea in 1991. He has been a visiting professor at Tokyo Institute of Technology in Japan from 2009 to 2010, the University of Electrocommunications Tokyo, Japan from 2017 to 2018, and Daigo Gyonbok Institute of Science and Technology, DGEST at Korea from 2017 to 2018. Dr. Cho's research interests include microstructure design and development, processing science, mechanical behavior, thin films and coatings, and characterization of various types of materials. His research has been supported from federal and state government agencies and industry and consortium as well. He has made over 100 publications, including journal articles, book chapters, conference papers, and five US patents. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Cho to our webinar series. Dr. Cho, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kasoni, for your introduction. So uh, uh, it is my pleasure to present my research work for the past uh, several years in the area of nanostructural ceramic coatings. So today, I will follow this order for my presentation, so starting with some challenges and application for ceramic coatings. And then I'm going to introduce some processing strategy uh, using some uh, soft chemistry for zinc oxide and titanium oxide using hydrothermal. And also I'm going to talk about uh, to uh, engineer the functional surface of those uh, materials. And then I'm going to talk about the, uh, the uh, usage of those nanostructured ceramic coating in different application, including photocatalytic uh, property, antibacterial property. And then uh, at the last point, I I'm going to talk about some hybrid nanostructure using co-shell configuration and also some surface modification to improve the, uh, the functional property. And then I'm going to finish with the conclusion and acknowledgement. So ceramics have many applications, especially for some mechanically challenging and some high temperature application. Uh, and also ceramics are commonly used as a coating or thin film, but there are some challenges in terms of the processing structure and performance. And processing is actually require most of case high temperature and it's a very expensive process and complicated. And also property wise, they can be quite brittle. So we need to uh, the address those issues. So processing wise, the, uh, the simple repeatable and low cost process would be very uh, desirable, specifically low temperature and low energy consumption to minimize the, the manufacturing cost and also these days, environmental friendly processing can be critical. And structure wise, in order to be successful with a coding uh, application, 
that uh, in require some conformal coverage on the surface because most of the application may not have the flat surface. So more complicated surface structure. So this conformal coating capacity is actually important. And also we need to have a control of the microstructure to generate the desirable property. And as I mentioned before, bulk ceramics are quite brittle. So ceramic coating will be also very brittle. So we need to have some hybrid configuration or some strain or tolerant ceramic microstructure to be able to have more reliable coating. And so performance wise, it, uh, as is the case for bulk ceramic, it, uh, coating also require uh, the environmental protection capa uh, capability under harsh condition. In fact, uh, this can uh, dif uh, differentiate the ceramic coating from many other organic and polymer coatings. And also still require some property uh, similar to bulk ceramic maintaining some, some good functional property. And as I briefly mentioned, or the reliability of the ceramic is really important in order to be uh, used in the advanced, most advanced concept in many applications. So these actually pictures shows uh, some of the uh, some ceramic application currently being used or has some potential to be used. So uh, for example, like a uh, Pilkington glass, which is a smart glass window, that has the, uh, uh, the ceramic coating so that it can provide some self-cleaning capability. That way the cleaning of the, uh, of the window outside can be quite uh, so simplified. You just need the water through the raining, regular raining or some just spraying the water. And also some great gel cell, which is basically dye sensitized solar cell that can be uh, used some some uh, building window or the building structure that can generate the power. So it can provide some self power to building structure. Another good example is actually can be found uh, from the new iPhone 12 that has the uh, kind of a new technology called the ceramic shield. So basically that's the ceramic coating or, or used on this uh, the, the, the front glass panel that provide a dramatic increase in uh, some uh, the toughness and drop failure resistance. So that can be done through some uh, some uh, ceramic nano crystal in glass. So basically that's the glass the ceramic protection on top of the glass panel. And also uh, some, some catalytic converter, the ceramic membrane, some display, some uh, the human, uh, the habitat, uh, some structure for some space program, some medical device, some microelectronics and flexible uh, device. All those, the ceramic coating can have some, some critical, uh, some, some usage and provide the enabling technology. In fact, some uh, summer barrier coating using a uh, gas turbine engine is uh, another sub good example of the ceramic coating usage, but specifically this is for the high temperature application. And also more recent application we are currently working with is the water and the waste management system. So basically try to generate the nanostructure ceramic that can well respond to external stimuli. So such as light field temperature. So we had a, a, the project from NASA. They are interested in, in some, some water management system for international space station or some deep space habitat program. So the water is very precious for, for their uh, some environment. So uh, they, they have very limited the source of the water. In fact, even the waste water needs to be recirculated and refiltered to be reused. So contamination is the biggest issue for their, the water, uh, for their water management system. So by using the ceramic surface in some plumbing line, inside of the plumbing line, some tank for portable, uh, portable water would be uh, the, the one application the ceramic film can provide some benefit. In addition, some lots of manufacturing facility, they require some waste water treatment. Most of them is using some bioremediation through some activated sludge technology. So one example is shown in this sewage treatment plant. But as you can see here, pretty, it's actually a big system, require lots of energy and the maintenance is actually also one of the, the big concerns. So ceramic surface or ceramic coating used in some of the application in, in, in that case, or some, uh, some used as some membrane and filter, it would be really the useful, uh, the, uh, some, some alternative, so, uh, the ceramic coating can be utilized. 
And also in the manufacturing facility to maintain the high purity water, which is not contaminated is also important. So, so that some, some uh, those are the more inert ceramic surface that provide some, some those cleaning capacity would be uh, beneficial. Even with the regional airport, they are generating lots of some waste fluid and water uh, because of some, some cleaning and some other issues. And also they uh, uh, have a lots of influx of the nutrient for microorganism, such as bacteria, fungi, algae, which can generate undesirable biofilm formation. But normally the regional airport to, uh, uh, don't have some enough infrastructure to take care of efficiently all those uh, uh, some, some environmental issue. That's why the ceramic coating and uh, the ceramic membrane technology can actually potentially provide some of some remedy for, for those concerns. So in order to be used the uh, use in those application as a ceramic coating, the key aspect is low temperature and the manufacturing cost needs to be reasonable. So low energy processing is actually critical. In fact, that uh, the low temperature and low energy processing examples are, are commonly found in nature, as you shown in this uh, formation of the biominerals. In this actual example, there are two examples. The nacre, uh, also called mother of pearl, as you shown here, or sea urchin. So mother uh, nacre has this the, the unique brick structure, and the sea urchin has this the porous structure. These are all made of the calcium carbonate. And in fact, if we look at some more detail, more high magnification view using the SEM, scanning electron microscope and transmit uh, electron microscope, both are all the assembly of the nanocrystal in the range of 20 to 100 nanometer as you shown in this TM images. With even higher magnification, we can see that these nanoparticles are connected through some, some mineral bridges as you shown in this arrow indication. So that indicates that this multi-scale organization, which is actually found in nature in ambient condition at very low temperature uh, environment, can be somehow copied in actual uh, the ceramic processing so that we can maintain the low temperature processing. And also this is going to be a very low uh, energy processing. In fact, in addition to the processing aspect, the, the property wise, the mechanical property is actually very, uh, 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 very good compared to the synthetic uh, calcium carbonate uh, processed from the uh, uh, from the laboratory environment. So by mimicking this uh, the, the uh, natural process, uh, the property can be also dramatically improved in addition to the low temperature processing possibility. So given that background, I'm going to present some processing and then structure and their relationship aspect of this uh, ceramic. Uh, work. So as you shown in, in, in the, the biomineralization process, our processing strategy will be using the low temperature aqueous solution deposition. So here uh, in, the, in the natural process for biominerals, it will take months or even years to generate the, the nice ceramic layer. But in the laboratory scale or in actual application, we cannot wait that long. So we have to have, we have to identify the most controlling parameter that is actually critical so, so that we can have some better control of those structure with a, uh, with, with a better uh, uh, property. So microstructure needs to be uh, better controlled so that we can uh, have the desirable property specifically tailored for some specific application. Uh, also, as I mentioned in the background, so reliability of this uh, ceramic film and ceramic structure would be critical to be used in some, some of the application. So our specific approach includes the hydro, hydrolysis reaction of the metal ions from the precursor solution so that we can control in situ precipitation of those uh, the particles from the supersaturated aqueous solution. So this uh, supersaturated aqueous solution will be similar to those uh, the biomineralization or natural process. Here, we want to better control of those precipitation that can form as a film or the coating structure. So we need to control nucleation and growth and aggregation and their kinetics from these processing parameters. So there are actually several uh, lots of processing uh, parameter we can control, including the temperature, concentration of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, precursor species, pH, pressure, electrical potential, 
some complexing agent and some some polymer. This can be ad, uh, uh, added. So uh, so the processing can be chemical best deposition, hydrothermal or electric uh, electrical uh, deposition or the liquid phase deposition. But in this presentation, I'm going to mostly focus on the hydrothermal uh, process. And then thin film will be formed through those structural hierarchy at different lengths of scale, as I showed you as an example from the biomineral example. So actually we try to understand better to have the better control of the structure for the desirable property. So there are also lots of metastable transition phases and states are involved. So actually we need to have some better control on those uh, the evolutions. So this shows the one of the example of the hydrothermal processing of zinc oxide. So there are many different substrates can be used. In fact, actually we use all those actually substrates for our process. So some, some ITO or some uh, frozen dope to tin oxide uh, for the substrate. And also we use a polymer or silicone or metal. So the first step will be the cleaning of those uh, the substrate surface. And then uh, some, some followed by uh, oxygen plasma treatment. So that can provide uh, some activation of the surface for deposition, especially for zinc oxide uh, processing to, in order to grow the, some uh, one dimensional nano rod structure, seed layer is actually the critical. So we, we generate the seed layer normally through some spin coating, even though some other process can, can be possible to generate the seed layer. And then from the, this spin coating case, we cure the, uh, the seed layer uh, between 140 degrees C and 300 degrees C. Normally high temperature curing is better, but we also work with uh, some polymer substrate. That's why we try to use uh, as low as possible to protect the polymer substrate. And once substrate is actually prepared, then they can be inserted in the uh, hydrothermal reactor. So this is like a, some pressure cooker. So just a heating up and then there's autogenous pressure uh, generated. And then actually the processing can be well contained without losing this, uh, the, the, uh, the precursor solution. So for the zinc oxide case, we use about 90 degrees C. And then this shows us some example of the low temperature processed zinc oxide case. This shows the effect of a precursor. So in terms of the solution precursor, we use a zinc nitrate or zinc acetate with some complexing agent, so HMTA, which we present for hexamethyl uh, methylene uh, tetraamine. And also sometimes we just use the directly ammonia without the complexing agent. In fact, the ammonia can produce the more high uh, supersaturated precursor solution that generates the more particular structure. But the nitrate or acetate case with the seed layer, we normally get the, uh, the one dimensional zinc oxide nanorod as shown here. So this is a top down view. So in order to understand this effect of a precursor and some solution condition, we can use this uh, solubility diagram. So this is a zinc ion from the precursor solution as a function of a pH. So by increasing the pH, the, the solubility of this zinc ion is reduced at the low pH, the solubility is increasing. So in fact, this line, including the equilibrium solubility line uh, from the thermodynamic uh, point of view, so higher than this one is a supersaturated so that the precipitation can occur. So supersaturation can be defined by uh, concentration over equilibrium solubility. So this is actually the S equal one line. So this is a supersaturated, it's under supersaturated. So there's no precipitation. So in order to have some, some precipitation, you need to have enough, some, some driving force. So you, you need to have some enough, some, some, some uh, supersaturation that can produce the bulk precipitation. But sometimes you want to control the, uh, the, the uh, nucleation through some substrate effect or some, some seed layer so, so that you can activate the surface nucleation, which can occur with a pretty minimal the supersaturation level. In between, there are some, some, uh, some aggregation of the nanoparticle from the bulk precipitation can be patterned in a certain uh, shape that can generate some oriented attachment. That actually aspect will be uh, discussed a little bit later. And also these zinc oxide nanorod as you shown in this example can also, the morphology can depend upon the, the substrate. So in this case, we use the fluorine doped oxide, which is quite rough with a seed layer. 
and also the seed layer was uh, formed on the uh, silicon wafer. So it, this is pretty smooth. So depending on those rough, roughness, actually uh, you can see more densely packed nanorad was actually observed from the silicon side. And then this is a more porous from the FTO, so more rough surface. So, so that actually you can control those, the, the density of the nanorad packing. So this is a top-down view. This is the cross-section as a side view. Even actually when we are using the uh, atomic layer deposition, uh, zinc oxide seed layer, which contains a smaller number of nucleation sites, they can actually produce the very uh, the large width of the zinc oxide nanorad as shown here. So these are all compared in the same magnification and everything was actually processed in the same condition, except the seed layer. Then actually you can see some different morphology of the surface can be generated. And then now mo I move on to the titanium oxide case. So titanium oxide has actually several different phases. The most common one is rutile or NATS. So for the rutile case, uh, the, the process itself is similar, but we have the different precursor. So we have the titanium chloride, and then we have the HCl to control pH. And also in this case, we are using the mixed solvent between ethanol and DI water. And then temperature can be uh, higher to generate some more uh, some uh, highly, uh, highly uh, better crystallinity of the, the uh, structure. So using uh, HCl, the, the pH control, and pH is actually really important to generate this, the rutile. So in order to generate the rutile, pH needs to be really low. On the other hand, if, uh, if we want to generate the NATS phase, actually we can add a sulfuric acid. By adding the sulfuric acid, we uh, preferentially actually uh, pre uh, form the, the NATS phase rather than rutile. Here, actually, the crystal, the structure, and the unit set of those structures is shown here for rutile and NATS. So rutile is uh, actually uh, the A direction for the unit set is the same. So C direction is actually uh, shorter. So this is a tetragonal structure. But on the other hand, NATS unit cell is actually, again, a direction and the B direction are the same, but the C direction is actually elongated and some more atoms per unit cell. So again, this is a tetragonal structure. Even though they have the different uh, some some uh, structure, they have actually they are all based upon this uh, arc the titanium octahedral as you shown here. So this is a titanium cation, and you have the six neighboring, and also here you have the six neighboring ions. So this actually uh, explains the possibility of the phase selection between rutile and NATS from the aqueous solution for titania. So as I mentioned, these are all based upon titanium octahedron. So the cation is here and anions uh, on, on the six neighbors to, to form the octahedron. So this actually the anion can be hydrated or some hydroxide or uh, the OH minus from the beginning and then for the, in order to form the rutile, um, this edge can be shared. So the edge sharing can be in a linear pattern to generate the rutile structure. So in fact, rutile will be actually showing uh, lots of cases in the one dimensional structure because of this uh, linear pattern formation. On the other hand, if the super saturation is uh, high, which means actually the pH can be higher, then rather than having those linear pattern, this edge sharing can be more zigzag pattern as you shown here, shown by this, uh, the, the orange line. Then this is more like a three-dimensional structure. Then it, it can form NATS. So in order to generate this actual three-dimensional structure, we can also add some, some sulfuric acid as you shown in this example. So by adding this uh, sulfuric acid, that actually dis, uh, that, uh, disrupt the, those linear, uh, I mean, edge sharing in a linear pattern. Then the, the, uh, this uh, polycondensation can be uh, obtained through some three-dimensional, as shown in this NATS case. So without the sulfuric, I mean, without sulfuric acid with a uh, high concentration of Cl, we can form the rutile titania. On the other hand, with the uh, sulfuric acid, we can generate the NATS. So that, that actually shows uh, some, some processing aspect. And also, I, actually, we have some, some some structural organization based upon some, some pro, uh, the solution condition. Specifically, we try to use the degree of supersaturation. So degree of supersaturation is the driving force for nucleation of those nanoparticles. 
So this is like uh, some undercooling for solidification. But undercooling can be easily measurable experimentally from the, the condition. But the, the degree of supersaturation is actually a little bit difficult experimentally to measure because the equilibrium solubility is kind of some hard to measure. So in our case, we used some calculation by knowing the activity product of those soluble species divided by some equilibrium constant. So we generate the solubility map. So titanium chloride concentration as a, as a function of pH. And then we generate the different level of a degree of supersaturation. So this is actually the actual level of the supersaturation between around the 60 to 180. And each condition, uh, the, the morphology or the microstructure ha have been actually uh, uh, evolved differently. So for example, in this condition around here, so this is about, about 120 to 150 supersaturation range, we tend to generate this nanoparticle. So, and then this is a schematic. And in fact, these nanoparticles are, are, are consisting of the very small uh, nanocrystallite of NRTS. So this, this is actually based upon the NRTS phase. And then we decrease the supersaturation, 100, 70, 50, 30. And actual morphology actually we observe is showing the dramatic change. Around the, uh, 50, we begin to see some nano sheet as shown here in the, from the top down SM view. And then that is maintained, but somehow the thickness of the nano sheet or nano plate is actually increasing like a nano blade. And up, uh, down to about 15 supersaturation, but further decreasing the supersaturation uh, be, uh, below this uh, condition is quite challenging because here we use the open vest, uh, the, some, some, some processing. So without that, uh, the closed vest processing, it's difficult to achieve. That's why we began to introduce the hydrothermal processing to generate more uh, lower supersaturation, which is more close to the equilibrium condition. So below 15, we actually um, begin to begin to use this hydrothermal processing to generate continuously increasing the thickness to generate a nanorod structure. But these nanorod and nanoblade are a little bit different from the normal the, the single crystalline, which is actually grown by some ion by ion. But this is actually the particle by particle. That's why I label non-classical, the growth pattern. So ideally, if these particles are uh, perfectly aligned, they, uh, these internal boundary would be fused into disappear, disappearing to form the, the single crystal, nano sheet, nano blade, or nano rod. So in the limited cases, we see this kind of some, some, some uh, conversion. But most of the case, actually, the internal the boundary seems to be remained. So, that's actually one of the, the current area we try to uh, achieve, how actually we can activate this, the, uh, the particle attachment with a good orientation that can be converted into more like a single crystalline the, the, the nanostructure. So this is the one example of the hydrothermal or the, the titania that shows a rutile nano rod and nano wire. So here we have the different condition A, B, C, D. So A is the, uh, the uh, higher uh, HCl concentration, so low pH. And then pH is increasing, so supersaturation is increasing. So you can see the dramatic change in the actual the surface morphology. So when the supersaturation or pH is very low, which means the more closer to the equilibrium condition, we begin to see some, uh, some very well formed, uh, the single crystalline nanorod, the square face, as you shown here. But most of the case is actually nano wire randomly arranged. By increasing the, the supersaturation, we begin to see those nano, rod, uh, nano wires actually bundle laterally to form nano rod. So the bigger nano rod as shown here. And then just keep increasing the supersaturation by reducing HCl. You can see the bigger nano rod formed. And then uh, so having really a large uh, enough supersaturation, you see lots of nano wire actually bundled together to form the nano wire. Here is only the top down view. But if you look from the side view, you can see very well uh, vertically aligned the nano rod form. But inside of the nano rod, actually you can see this kind of some nano wire packing, but they actually pretty well, well packed. So in order to see some inside the structure of this nano rod, we use a transmission electron microscope. So here is actually the example of those nano rod. And then you can see that some, some focusing on the specific to have some higher magnification to see the lattice image 
And also we can get the nanobeam electron diffraction. So this nanobeam electron diffraction look like a, the single crystal pattern. So even though there are some many nano wire, not completely fused yet, but the orientation is almost uh, perfectly aligned. And then this is actually the nano rod direction, so 002 direction. Some portion of the nano rod, actually the alignment is not as good. So you can see more clearly those nano wire bundling. So in those cases, still the orientation is relatively good, but compared to this one, there's a, some slight misorientation between nano wires. So that's why you are seeing some, some ring or some streaking pattern from those diffracted pattern. So here the idea is nano wire is initially formed and then they actually grow well. And then, but if you have the more and more nano wires, wires, they actually begin to bundle so that it, it, uh, it forms the bigger nano rod and the square shape. And then if these actually nano wires are perfectly aligned, then internal boundary will be all disappear by just fusing. Then actually you can generate a single crystalline nano rod. But in this case, it didn't reach it to this single crystal nano rod yet. Actually, that's actually the stage of this, this case. So stage is C by having this actually the well oriented but still it's not perfectly uh, uh, aligned. So this is actually some, some of the base upon the, uh, the non-classical crystallization theory through those the oriented attachment, but oriented attachment was not perfect. And then this is the, uh, the, the example of the NRTS titania. So in this case, we use the sulfuric acid. So by adjusting the ratio of the HCl and sulfuric acid, we can generate the NRTS rather than rutile. So in this example, we fix the sulfuric acid and then control the HCl concentration. So HCl concentration is actually very high and then decreasing from here to here. So this is actually the high HCl. So this is the low pH and then low supersaturation. So more close to equilibrium condition. And here is much away from the equilibrium condition by having low uh, HCl, so higher so supersaturation degree. In fact, uh, we can use this equilibrium shape of the NRTS, which is uh, constructed by the lowest possible surface uh, planes. So the lowest energy from the uh, NRTS is 101. And 001 is actually higher, but not the highest. Highest energy uh, for the NRTS is a 110 surface. But this, so this surface doesn't show up here, but mostly bound by this 101 type, the surface. And then a little bit of this 001 from the both end. So when the supersaturation is uh, really low, then actually you can see this equilibrium shape, very uh, the consistent with this the, the, uh, the, the drawing. But the supersaturation is increasing, then those the, the equilibrium shape is a little bit distorted. And then here it's almost actually uh, impossible to identify those equilibrium shape. And especially at high enough supersaturation, you begin to see more like a particle structure to generate this uh, domain structure. Uh, so each domain is consisting of this uh, smaller uh, nano crystalline. So in order to identify the, some, some uh, crystal orientation of those nanoparticles, we did X-ray diffraction. So here we have the, uh, those, uh, the increasing con uh, concentration of a uh, HCl, so increase, uh, the decreasing the pH, so A1 through A6. So if you look at A6, which is this one, so very good uh, equilibrium shape uh, the uh, NRTS crystal formed. You can see that uh, this 101 and 004 are actually the contributing, which is actually making sense. But if you look at the very high supersaturation case with a low HCl concentration, 004 peak is dramatically increased. In fact, actually this 004 peak is actually increasing as a function of a decreasing HCl concentration, uh, 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 decreasing HCl concentration. In fact, this 004 peak can be overlapped with the substrate 2000, which is from fluorine doped tin oxide. But this actually increasing is very systematic with the uh, uh, concentration of HCl. And also 101 peak is actually stronger than 004 in random orientation case of the NRTS, which means this is really highly textured with the 004. So this actually film with this small nano crystalline they are ha having the, the 004 orientation. 
that is also confirmed in this uh, some some uh, transmission electron microscopy uh, some characterization to again to see the inside. So this is a cross section. So this is like a dome shape to the, the NIPS, and then this is the side view from SEM. And then we take the uh, we took the sample from some top portion and the bottom portion, and then we get the TM for high resolution, and also the uh, corresponding uh, the electron beam uh, diffraction pattern. So here top portion. It's mostly, uh, it's like uh, some single crystal pattern, as is, show, as is the case for the non-rod case. On the other hand, the bottom portion is like a more like a, the ring pattern, so it's a more like a polycrystalline case. So here we uh, envision that uh, this actually can be made from this equilibrium shape particle that can be uh, attached each other through this 004 plane. And in fact, if we look at the 004 plane with a high resolution image, we begin to see some, some edge dislocation type. So that indicates that uh, this is actually the particle attachment. But again, but it's not really perfectly uh, the aligned because you have some, some, some uh, edge dislocation that can accommodate this misorientation. So again, this is actually some imperfectly aligned through this uh, the particle attachment. Then I'm going to talk about some photocatalytic performance of oxide surface. So zinc oxide, titanium oxide, those are all on the wide band gap semiconductor. So they have some band gap energy more than three electron volt. So usually it requires the UV light to excite the electron and hold pairs to the conduction band and the valence band. Once the, the hole is created in the valence band that can react with the OH minus, this can be from the, some water or moisture from the outside environment, they can generate this hydroxyl radical. And hydroxyl radical is a really strong oxidative species. So it can oxidize or decompose any organic species. And also in the, in, in the, in the electron side, that can also react with the oxygen to generate the superoxide of the radical. In fact, this, uh, the superoxide can also react uh, through the reaction to generate hydrogen peroxide and finally hydroxyl radical. So in idle event, they, they generate the hydroxyl radical that can be really the strong oxidative species. And also in order to be successful with the photocatalytic surface, we need to have some increasing the surface as you shown in this one dimensional zinc oxide nanorod or more complicated some, some titanium root uh, the surface structure. And also impurity and some defect can be important to create some sub band within the band gap energy. So that actually is so narrowing the band gap so, uh, that can potentially respond to the visible light. So this shows one example of the zinc oxide for catalytic property on the UV light. So that, that can provide some self-cleaning capacity from uh, some bacteria, some volatile, uh, the volatile organic compound, oil, and any con some organic contaminants. So here we use the, the uh, uh, pretty common plastic surface uh, from this polycarbonate. And then the processing was done at 90 degrees C and see the layer for zinc oxide nanorod was actually uh, cured at 140 degrees C in order to have the, the, uh, the uh, polycarbonate that can survive at the, uh, the, uh, during the processing temperature. So we have actually two zinc oxide film uh, uh, cases. So one is the, this one step process or the other is actually a two step process. So in the two step process, basically after one hour, the, the precursor solution is replaced with a freshly prepared new precursor solution. So it's a one hour plus one hour. This is a continuous two hour processing. In the continuous two hour processing, from the top down view, you can see the nano rod bundle. And actually, uh, it, this actually the cross sectional view shows the, the vertically aligned this nano rod. So this is after fracture. And then this is actually more denser and also the short nano wire formed, but still the vertically aligned. So we prepare these two uh, the surface with uh, uh, the zinc oxide, the first sample, second sample. As a control sample, we use the bell uh, polycarbonate and then drop the uh, methylene blue dye and then expose under the UV light source, 365 nanometers. So this is the UVA. And then we wait one hour, two hours, three hours. And then as you can see here, after one hour, dramatic, the, uh, the, the color change occur. And after two hours, complete bleaching 
from the the uh, the, the methylene dye, methylene blue dye was, was uh, obtained, and here more dense structure. It takes a little bit longer, but after three hours, also complete uh, some uh, some bleaching is, is, is uh, has occurred. So that indicates that this actually shows a very strong the photocatalytic some dye degradation capacity through the this zinc oxide surface. This is actually uh, not from the UV light because in the control sample, even after three hours, color was almost uh, changing. So that indicates that the, this, the, the degradation is due to the photocatalytic surface from the zinc oxide. So in order to get some more quantitative or some data, we also did some this methylene blue dye degradation test with the UVB spectral. So basically, uh, some some those are the sample is inserted into the the methylene blue dye solution, and then every one hour, two hours, three hours, four hour, you take the uh, the this dye solution and get the uh, the UVB absorption spectra. So for the methylene blue dye, there is a, some char characteristic absorption uh, of this uh, methylene blue dye occurring at 663 nanometer. So it is a time zero, and then this is keep decreasing. That indicates the dye degradation. So after four hours, it's about 90% degradation occurring. And also we were able to deposit this zinc oxide nano rod film on the various substrate, including titanium, stainless steel, and Teflon. In fact, this Teflon case is very porous. I mean, it actually the, uh, the arrangement is actually very porous, but still it provides a very strong the dye degradation capacity. So actually the, the zinc oxide nano rod on Teflon shows the the best performance so far. And also we compare that with a titanium oxide, nano rod. So this is a top-down view. This is actually the nano wire bundled structure. And then from the side view, again, this is all nano rod. But the dye degradation test shows that the degradation rate is actually slower. So uh, after four hours, it's only 36% degradation. So we use the NRTS film to have this uh, the same dye degradation, so especially for the this uh, uh, the zero zero one texture uh, the uh, NRTS film, the degradation was much faster as shown here. So after one hour, this actually dyes uh, the colors are completely bleached. So that indicates a very strong dye degradation performance. So as expected, when we have some more quantitative data through the UV visible spectra, after four hours, it's almost gone. So in fact, the dye degradation percentage is about ninety three percent after uh, the four hour, the dye degradation, I mean, the, the UV radiation. So that indicates that this actually, the NRTS film is very, the performance is very comparable to the zinc oxide. And then also we, we did some anti the the surface characteristic. This work was in collaboration with the Professor Karin Sowers group at the Binghamton uh, Biofilm Research Center. So this is uh, again, the same zinc oxide film it's uh, used for the, uh, the dye degradation test. So using this uh, the, uh, zinc oxide, the, uh, we actually measure the antibacterial property just by exposing this, uh, the surface to some, uh, some bacteria. So we use uh, the carrier test in this example using the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a gram negative of the bacteria, but also we have some, some example from the, the gram positive the virus, which is a Staphylococcus. Uh, 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 so when we have this actually the bacteria is actually uh, uh, contacted with uh, this uh, zinc oxide surface, we uh, uh, put the sample in one hour, two hour, three hour in dark environment. And the PC, the polycarbonate is a control sample. And we can see that with the zinc oxide surface, there is a dramatic decrease in the bacteria count. So this is actually more than the three log reduction. So which means 99.9% .9 bacteria was actually killed. So, but here there is no light. So there's no photocatalytic for effect. So this is actually due to this, the unique, the, the surface structure generated by this nano size, uh, the, the nano rod, the, the shape. And the same, uh, the, the surface is actually exposed to the light so using the UV or the fluorescent light. So fluorescent light is mostly from the visible light. And then the exposed to 50 minutes for dark and then a fluorescent light and the UV environment. 
using the same sample, so co control sample with a zinc oxide coated uh, polycarbonate surface. And then with the, the UV light, you can see more than two log reduction. Again, that indicates that 99% the, the bacteria was actually killed on this the surface. But this time actually we are using the UV, but the visible light actually didn't activate, uh, did, uh, didn't deactivate the bacteria much, but the UV light did. So that indicates that for the catalytic, the bacteria killing from this uh, zinc oxide the film. And also we tested with a gram positive uh, the bacteria. So basically a gram negative is more uh, and uh, the more resistance to antibiotic because this has the two layer uh, the, uh, the membrane cell, but uh, the gram positive has just a single layer membrane cell. So the, this actually gram negative bacteria is actually more difficult to be killed by some, some antibiotic. So that, is, that actually is also observable in our uh, the experiment. So we compare with the control sample, which was the Teflon in this case, and this is the NITS coated Teflon. So in the dark environment for two hour and uh, four hour exposure, about three to four log reduction of the, the bacteria killing occur. That indicates that 99.99% of the bacteria was killed on this surface in dark environment for this the, the gram positive uh, the bacteria. So th this is a bit actually more effective. On the other hand, gram negative bacteria case, Still, I mean, this shows about one to close to two low reduction, but the effectiveness is actually uh, smaller than compared to gram positive. And these uh, sample is also exposed to the uh, some, some UV light with the, the control sample and NATS coated Teflon. So there's a, some, some slight increase in terms of the some, some low reduction, but this is not as effective as the case for the dark environment. Same thing with the gram uh, negative. So the, the uh, improvement is actually observed, but it's not as uh, great as for the, the, the dark environment. But the UV exposure actually indicates some, some effectiveness. And also time is relatively short, about 10 minutes. And also the ant antibacterial test was done through the attachment assay. So this may be actually the more relevant experiment for this kind of a ceramic surface because we are expecting the ceramic surface will be immersed in the liquid. So this is actually the liquid test as shown in this example. So, so, so putting the uh, sample submerged in the liquid for six hours in the dark environment for some specific bacteria, in this case, Pseudomonas uh, uh, the bacteria, we can, we can actually uh, count the bacteria, the proliferation on the surface for polycarbonates or controls uh, the sample using the fluorescent microscopy. So you can see lots of bacteria still remained uh, actually formed in this uh, the control sample. But when there is actually the zinc oxide film, they are actually all gone. And also FTO, the, the coated glass, this is the control sample. So you see some of those the, the, uh, bacteria or uh, some attached to this uh, surface after six hours. But here with the titania, the NRTS film attached to this substrate, the, all the bacteria is actually the disappear. So that indicates the effectiveness of this uh, the ceramic surface, both zinc oxide and titania NRTS uh, film. In fact, actually we count those the number of bacteria cell for six hour uh, attachment experiment for Teflon and NRTS coated uh, Teflon. Also this actually shows uh, some about two to three reduction in terms of the bacteria counting. So that indicates that effectiveness of this the nanostructure, in this case, the nanotexture, the, the NRTS surface. In fact, one observation we had in this experiment was during the fluorescent uh, the, the imaging, the fluorescent uh, the, um, uh, microscopy is using the, the UV light. So the, the wavelength is about 304 nanometer. We began to observe some dimming of those fluorescence. That indicates that uh, the bacteria is actually being killed during the imaging. That indicates it's a photocatalytic deactivation of the bacteria. So when we compare with the Teflon, it's actually slower for the dimming. But the NRTS coated Teflon, the dimming was much faster. In, it, this is actually up to 60 seconds. And after 30 seconds, the Teflon is about maintained, but the NRTS coated Teflon is keep decreasing. So this actually initial decrease may be due to some, some, uh, some UV light exposure, but actually this continuous decrease should be coming from those, the, the, the surface that is actually react under the, 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 the UV light irradiation. Okay, given that I'm going to now focus on the engineering the surface functionality through some core shell configuration and the surface modification. 
So we try to have uh, some more enhanced photo response from this uh, semiconducting oxide through some, uh, some hybrid structure like oxide core and oxide shell structure. So in this example, we have the rutile core, so rutile nanorod, and then we can form the anatase shell. Then electron and uh, this is actually electron band diagram. So the electron is actually moving into rutile side and then hole is moving to the anatase side. And this actually the uh, electron hole separation can be more efficient by avoiding the recombination. And this actually the hole can provide this uh, hydroxyl radical. They can be very strong oxidative species. And also even hole itself can make the direct oxidation of the organic species. And also this kind of hybrid structure can be used in the dye synthesizer solar cell. So using the dye electron hole uh, pairs are generated and the separation can be more effective through this uh, hybrid structure. In addition, by having this anatase surface, it can also increase the, the surface area. And also anatase is actually known to be more photoactive compared to rutile, as you shown in, in our also previous uh, example as well. So we try to have this surface functionality through the hybrid oxide system. So as I mentioned, so we have the rutile nanowire and then they bundle to form the rutile nanorod and through the surface functionalization, we generate the, the core shell structure and then electron hole on separation can be more efficient and also electron transport can be more rapid through this the single crystalline nature of this path. And then additional treatment such as some ion exchange and also we can change this functional surface. And this actually the three example shows from the just rutile nanorod. And this is the anatase covered rutile nanorod. So actually you can see more development on the surface of the rutile nanorod. And also we can generate the zinc oxide on the surface of this rutile nanorod. So those the hybrid structural generation can be possible. And so in order to generate that anatase surface, we can just use the another hydrothermal processing. So initial rutile nanorod, and this is the hydrothermally uh, grown anatase. Initially, we expected the anatase is grown directly from the rutile nanorod, but because of the some surface effect, initial the growth was actually through the some, some rutile phase. And then actually the anatase phase actually uh, took over to form. So this generate anatase and the rutile, the structure. And we compare this, uh, the. Uh, Use this uh, surface for as a photo anode in dye sensitized solar cell, and we tested the uh, the IB character characteristic on on the solar uh, simulator. So here you can see that if you only have the rutile nanorod, you have the high open circuit voltage but low uh, the uh, low uh, the um, short circuit current. And then if you are using the zinc oxide only, then high short circuit current, but uh, the small open circuit voltage. But by having the, this, uh, the, the, uh, the hybrid structure like a zinc oxide on rutile, anatase on rutile, this performance is keep increasing. In fact, the best performance that was ob observed in this the anatase on rutile nanorod just by annealing at a little bit higher temperature. Then actually we achieved the higher uh, the current while uh, reducing relatively small amount to, uh, for the uh, open circuit voltage. And actually the, the power conversion efficiency was about 4%, but the field factor was already uh, low. So still there's uh, some more room to further improve the, this dye solar cell configuration using this hybrid uh, the, uh, structure. And another scheme can be possible through this uh, the etching and ion exchange to generate this anatase surface shell. So in this example, Again, we have the rutile nanorod, but through the etching, you can generate this the, uh, sodium titanate shell layer as shown in this reaction through this alkaline hydrothermal processing. And then by dipping into the, the, uh, the nitric acid, there will be some ion exchange. So the hydrogen is replaced with the sodium to generate hydrogen titanium surface, which is quickly uh, changed the transform into the titanium, which is anatase phase. Uh, through this condensation reaction. So this shows the, the etching, uh, the, just a pure rutile nanorod after etching. So you can see some development on the surface. And this is ion exchange after three hour. So in order to see those anatase formation, we did some Raman spectroscopy characterization. 
So this is just a pure root type. So you have the, these four characteristic peaks. And then with the uh, alkaline hydrothermal etching process, you see some characteristic peaks from this uh, sodium titanate. And even ion exchange for a short period, these peaks will remain. But after ion exchange for three hours, all those uh, sodium titanate related peaks are gone. And mostly remained with the root type with uh, some, some peak begin to form on this actual location, which is representing for the, the NRTS peak. And also we, we uh, measured the, uh, the methyl and blue dye degradation testing. So rutile nanorod itself is, has very poor the dye degradation performance. On the other hand, NATS, the, the, those the dome shape, the, the texture film showed about 94% after four hours. So very strong the photo, uh, catalytic degradation. And zinc oxide nanorod, especially on Teflon surfaces shows a really strong behavior, strong photocatalytic behavior, which is shown here. So by having those hybrid structure, in this case, NATS and rutile through the hydrothermal processing, we improve the, the dye degradation performance, but still relatively small. And then even with the sodium titanate formation on the shell, we are actually increasing the dye degradation performance, but the most dye degradation performance can be achieved through this ion exchange uh, process on the rutile, uh, the, the nanorod nano to generate the NATS shell on the surface. So the, the dye degradation performance is about 94% at four hour of the, the exposure. So this is very uh, comparable to the NATS, the, uh, the, uh, the, the surface. And also this actually scheme can be used for some cobalt doping or some metal ion doping. So in this example, the once you have this etching process to generate the sodium titan titanate, it can be uh, dipped into the cobalt nitrate solution to generate, uh, to have the ion exchange between cobalt and sodium to generate cobalt titanate. So X-ray diffraction confirmed that this sodium titanate related peak and then after ion exchange, you have some cobalt titanate related peak actually uh, shown in this XRD. And this is the actual microstructure from those the ion exchange from three hour to nine hour. So you can see that more development on the surface of those nanorod. So actually it's getting uh, some, some bigger and wider and there's a more development on the surface. And because of this cobalt doping, the, the uh, band gap energy is actually dramatically reduced to about three to about 2.8 electron volt. Sheet resistance is also decreased from mega ohm range into the kilo ohm range. And because of the cobalt doping, also magnetic property also increased in, in this film. And this is the last example. Actually, we can do some surface modification so that the further improve the, uh, the some, some property, some four catalytic property and some other properties. In this example, we use a zinc oxide nanoplate. So actually this is in collaboration with the Professor Jung Il Hong's group at DGIST and also working with the Professor Nojaki and Professor uh, Dr. Oshima from uh, uh, Japan. So uh, DGIST group actually produced uh, this uh, nanoplate, so well aligned, A-axis oriented. So in order to generate this nanoplate, they use the A-axis uh, oriented uh, the seed layer. And then they, they actually form this nanoplate. So this actually big plane is from the C plane, so, so basal plane. And then this is just a typical nanorod actually uh, on silicon, but because there was no uh, seed layer, this is actually mostly lying down on the silicon su surface. And then we did some, some Raman analysis. And here, this is from the nanorod. So you have actually this characteristic, uh, uh, some um, E2 high phonon on uh, the mode uh, here. And, but actually uh, for the nanoplate case, you have the two peaks, E2 high, and also this one is actually longitudinal optical phonon mode uh, at, occurring here. In fact, uh, this actually mode will disappear if the incident beam of the Raman spectroscope is perpendicular to the C axis. So that's why most of the line nanorod case actually showing the no peak at this uh, the, the frequency. But for the nanoplate, this is actually the C orientation is perpendicular to the incident beam because of this orientation. But this actually appearing very broad peak here that indicates that this is very uh, the oxygen deficient. So lots of oxygen vacancy. So that indicates that this nanoplate is more defective, much more defective compared to the nanorod uh, the, the, uh, case. 
And then we have two different surface modification process. One is the high beam electron beam irradiation at one mega electron volt that was done in this uh, Takasaki Advanced Radiation Research Institute. And then also the nanoplate was actually exposed under the, the wet UV oxidation. This experiment was done at uh, Professor Nozaki's uh, laboratory. So when this is exposed to the, uh, the electron beam, you can see that this peak is dramatically increasing, indicating the more defective, more oxygen vacancy. And also this is a, has some, some red shift that also in, in, indicates that the oxygen deficiency. But when you have this wet uh, uh, UV oxidation, this peak is completely disappear while maintaining this peak only. That indicates that the surface defect can be completely or almost completely passivated. So by using this UV oxidation or some, some electron beam radiation, surface characteristic of those defect population can be adjusted. And then we measure the, the dye degradation test. So those, the nanoplate has about 40% dye degradation at four, uh, four hour exposure under the UV. This is not surprising compared to the, the, the nano rod case. Nano rod is about 88% through about 98%, depending on the specific the morphology of the nano rod. But this is a highly uh, the densely populated nano rod, well aligned. But this case is actually the population is not that densely, uh, I mean, those nanoplate is densely populated. So because of this actually the, uh, the structure was not designed for dye degradation or for catalytic degradation for uh, so some um, purpose. So this will be lower some, some performance, but after uh, the UV uh, oxidation process, this actually the degradation performance is actually almost zero. So because it's all passivated, that indicates that those surface defect can contribute to those photocatalytic reaction. On the other hand, if it, it is exposed under the electron beam, then actually the defect population is dramatically increasing. Then this performance is actually uh, actually uh, strongly, I mean, the performance is increasing dramatically. So about 70% degradation after four hours. That indicates that how we control those surface of the defect uh, population, we can actually control those photocatalytic property as shown in this example. Okay, so this is actually the summary uh, slide. So I showed the example of the hydro uh, thermally processed zinc oxide nanorod, titania nanorod with uh, the rutile phase and then the nanotextured NATS of the structure. So I also talk about the single crystalline case for the zinc oxide, but titania case actually is, so, uh, formed through the imperfect oriented attachment. Controlling the, the processing condition, we can adjust the shape, size, and orientation so that actually the property can be adjusted. And these actually, uh, the cases was uh, tested for photocatalytic and antimicrobial uh, uh, the property. And also I showed the example of those, the, the design of the surface functionality through some various scheme, especially some core shell uh, scheme using the rutile nanorod and some other functional layer for photo anode, photo catalytic surface and some cation doping. And also I showed the example of the nanoplate with some high energy radiation to control those, the, the defect structure and population that can influence some functional property. So this is going to be our future direction. So we are going to continuously characterize this oriented attachment of the titania rutile nanowire case that forms a nanorod. So currently it's actually imperfectly oriented, uh, uh, oriented so that it didn't make the single crystal nanorod yet. So actually we tried to generate this single crystal nanorod through this oriented attachment idea and continuously working on some hybrid approach. And also we are going to look at the possibility of this band gap narrowing so that the, the surface can be more uh, responsive to the, some visible light uh, the exposure. And also most uh, currently so far, we have tested with this antibacterial uh, uh, property uh, for titania or zinc oxide. We haven't tested with some hybrid structure made through this core shell and surface modification. So this actually the, the, uh, the hybrid approach and surface modification will be tested for this antimicrobial uh, the coding uh, application. So finally, I would like to acknowledge the funding for this actually the project from this institute, uh, this actually uh, the agencies. And also, well, I also really appreciate uh, some support from research facility. 
And also, uh, importantly, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, the, my former student who contributed the most of the data in, uh, presented in this example, in this presentation. And also, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators at Binghamton University, as well as some, some other institution. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cho, for your uh, presentation. We definitely appreciate your uh, contribution to the seminar. Uh, I noticed that there are a couple of uh, questions in the chat from uh, Noah. Uh, I don't know if you would like me to uh, read them or if you'd like to take, take a look at them. Yeah, let me try to read this one. So the question was in nanostructure, wouldn't it better to see the structure in color? Perhaps we could see more details that way. And it is possible to view them through 3D, uh, the VR, is a virtual reality? Yes, yes, through goggles. So we can see more, like we can touch, we can rotate it, see more things that we cannot see on a 2D picture. Yes. But uh, most of, I mean, the, all of those SEM and uh, the, the TM pictures are black and white. Some people do some image processing to, to make them into color, but optical microscope, we can generate some color using some polarized light. So sometimes, yeah, color can be useful to better understand. And also we can do some, some image processing to label with a different color. But I haven't really uh, tried with this uh, three-dimensional dimens virtual reality. So if you can provide some, any, some, some useful insight, I'll, I'll be happy to discuss further. And the, the next question was with the metal and blue, why are you using blue? What if we use another color such as red, orange? Would the color still change? Yes, actually that's the one example. The one, uh, some common way to test the dye degradation performance is using some dye. So there are different colors of dye. It can be uh, orange or red or blue, but actually the metal and blue dye uh, seems to be the one of the most common. That's why we, we test it. And definitely, I mean, we can test with some, some other dye and we are, I'm also expecting the similar response because they are all based upon some organic molecule, which will be uh, easily uh, degraded by those hydroxy radical generated through this photocatalytic reaction. Thank you. I think uh, those are all the questions that I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, if there are any other questions, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask. This is Mohammed. <clears throat> I do have a question. Thank you, Professor Cho, for such a great and informative uh, talk. Yeah. So regarding the uh, uh, zinc oxide nanorods, yeah. uh, did you use any kind of uh, membrane to grow them or the growth was directly on the substrate? I used a seed layer. So that was the key. I mean, zinc yes. oxide in general can be grown on any surface. But in order to generate a one-dimensional nanorod type structure, we need some, some seed layer. So, that so there was no implementation. Okay, so there was no any kind of porous membrane to allow the zinc uh, oxide uh, nanorods to grow vertically. It's just the seed layer on the substrate and then yes. the uh, uh, hydrothermal processes, right? Yes, actually, that's actually a good point. We used to use the porous membrane on top of the seed layer to grow those uh, nanorod in a very regular pattern. Yeah. We try that. So for example, in the one hole, you can grow the one nanorod and then it's a regularly arranged in X, Y direction. That's actually the possibility. But yeah, you, still, yeah, you need still the, the seed layer to trigger yeah. those nanorod. Yeah, that's what we have been trying to do. However, uh, we have been successfully getting around like 10 micron uh, tall nanorods. However, they are not well separated. So do you have any ideas or recommendation how they can be well separated? Because for our application, we need them to be well ordered and well separated. I think that will be depending on the size of the hole and those, the, the spacing between the holes. 
because uh, somehow if it's a grow about as, as you mentioned about 10 micron this is quite uh, the, the long so yeah. from this uh, solution processing they tend to get bundled during those uh, the drying process so somehow you need to have the uh, strong enough so that it doesn't bend during the drying and then actually it, it, it has to be separated enough to avoid those so actually and and then actually ideally you want to grow the one nanorod per hole so the solution condition as, as i described in, in my presentation needs to be adjusted or optimized so there are actually the several some of those parameters that needs to be controlled then i think it's possible to grow those regularly patterned nanorod with a certain spacing thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any uh, other questions? Noah is asking another uh, question. Would you repeat how you do the process with H2O2, heavy water, and its importance? Probably, I may need some clarification on this question. H I don't like, yeah, could, yeah. <clears throat> you you showed like a like a process of the you doing it with H two and A O, and um, I think there was something before the biology that you started. Uh, to yeah, I, I can about. share share the presentation again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Can you see my slide? No, it's uh, it's gone. It was there and then it uh, disappeared. Okay, let me try again. Okay, can can you see? Yes, yes. Now we can see the acknowledgement slide. Okay, let yeah. me move. Maybe it was uh, something with sterilization. I'm not sure. Oh, the schematic here? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. So this is actually the, the process. So once you generate the hole, that can actually react with the OH from water. So they, after reaction, they generate the hydroxyl radical. Same thing with the electron. Once the electron react with uh, the oxygen, they generate the superoxide radical. And then through, through, through several steps of the process, it generates a hydro, uh, hydrogen peroxide by reacting with this C, I mean, HO, and then HO with uh, the uh, H plus. And then this is also reacted with the electron to generate hydroxyl radical. So this is actually the part of the process during, uh, during the process. From, so this hydrogen peroxide is generated from the electron, generated from here. That will be contributing to those the photocatalytic reaction. Oh, so that makes the whole change. Yes, so actually we are not really dealing with H2O2. This is a part of the, pro the byproduct during the oh. process. Okay. So initially, it's an electron. Now converted into superoxide. And then a superoxide becomes uh, this product. And then hydrogen peroxide. And then hydroxyl radical. All those will be contributing to those uh, decomposition of the organic species. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other uh, questions before we conclude the session? Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cho, uh, on behalf of uh, Binghamton University and our colleagues at uh, VIT, we would like to uh, thank you for your uh, 
participation and support as part of this uh, joint webinar uh, series. We sincerely appreciate your uh, contribution and you spending uh, time with us to share more information about your research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And before we conclude, I would just like to uh, mention that uh, next week we have our last uh, presentation for 2020 uh, with the, one of our colleagues from VIT, Professor Nuruj Kumar Sahu, who is an associate professor with the Center for Nanotechnology uh, Research. He will talk about multifunctional magnetic nanomaterials for biomedical applications. So this will be our last uh, seminar in 2020. And then uh, we will have a break until January 14th, which is when we will resume the webinar series with a presenter from Binghamton University. So once again, thank you for your uh, participation and look forward to seeing everyone again next week. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mogamad and Professor So. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dean Vasudevan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thank you. So, thank you for the thank nice you. talk. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>